What? exploded Geranum. Rach felt moved to explain. He ain't human. He's a machine. Namarty broke out passionately. Judge up, don't believe that. It's ridiculous. But Geranum held up an admonitory hand, his eyes gleaming. Why do you say that, Rach? My father was in Mycogen once. He told me all about it. In Mycogen, they talk about robots a lot. Yes, I know. At least I have heard so. The Mycogenians believe that robots were once very common among their ancestors, but they were wiped out. Namarty's eyes narrowed. But what makes you think that Merzel is a robot? Robots are made out of metal, aren't they? That's so, Rach's voice was earnest. But there were a few robots that looked just like human beings, and they live forever. Namarty shook his head violently. Ridiculous legends. Jojo, why are we listening? Tell me, young man, what makes you think Demersel is a robot? Did your father tell you so? No, sir. It's just my own idea, but I'm sure of it. Why? What makes you so sure? It's just something about him. He doesn't change. He doesn't get older. He doesn't show emotions. Something about him looks like he's made of metal. Geranum sat back in his chair and looked at Rach. Suppose he is a robot, young man. Why should you care? Does it matter to you? Of course it matters to me. I'm a human being. I don't want no robot in charge of running the Empire. Geranum turned to Namarty with a gesture of eager approval. You hear that, G.D.? I'm a human being. I don't want no robot in charge of running the Empire. Put him on Holovision and have him repeat it over and over until it's drummed into every person on Trantor. Hey, I can't say that on Holovision. I can't let my father find out. No, of course not. We'll find some other door light. Namarty was skeptical. And what happens when Demersel proves he's not a robot? Really, smiled Geranum. How will he do that? Climb down now and whine to the public that he is to a human being. That would be almost as destructive to him as being a robot. G.D., we have the villain in a no-win situation, and we owe it all to this fine young man here. Cleon I burst into Demersel's private office, panting slightly. Demersel! Demersel looked up with a trace of surprise and rose smoothly to his feet. Sire? The Emperor slammed the hologram down on Demersel's desk. What is this? Will you tell me that? Demersel looked at what the Emperor had given him. It was a beautiful hologram, sharp and alive. One could almost hear the little boy, perhaps ten years old, speaking the words that were included in the caption, I don't want no robot in charge of running the Empire. Am I wrong in supposing that the whole intent of this flyer is to accuse you of being a robot? That does seem to be its intention, sire. Well, this not only denigrates you, it denigrates me, and whoever did it should be executed forthwith. It was this Geranum, of course, who is behind it. Undoubtedly, sire, but proving it might be rather difficult. Nonsense! I have enough proof. I want an execution. Consider, sire, if that would be wise. It would make you appear to be a tyrant and a despot. Your rule has been a most successful one through kindness and mildness. What would you do then? Go before the people and say, Look at me. I am no robot. No, sire for that would destroy my dignity, and, worse yet, yours. Then? I am not certain, sire. Get in touch with Selden. Sire? What is so difficult to understand about my order? Get in touch with Selden. In two days, Geranum had swept Trantor, as Harry muttered to Doors, it was a campaign that had all the marks of military efficiency. Doors replied, At this rate, 
He's going to make himself first minister in a week, and if he wishes, emperor in two weeks. Selden shook his head. It will collapse, Doris. What? Geranum's party or the empire? Geranum's party. The story of the robot has created an instant stir, especially with the effective use of that flyer. But a little thought, a little coolness, and the public will see it for the ridiculous accusation it is. But Harry, you needn't pretend with me. It is not a ridiculous story. How could Geranum possibly have found out that Demersel is a robot? Oh, that. My Rach told him so. Rage? You mean, you told Rage that Demersel was a robot and had him pass on the news to Geranum? Doris looked utterly horrified. No, I couldn't do that. You know I couldn't tell Rach or anyone that Demersel was a robot. I told Rach as firmly as I could that Demersel was not a robot, but I did ask him to tell Geranum that he was. He is under the firm impression that he lied to Geranum. But why, Harry, why? Geranum is a Mycogenian by birth, so he was filled from youth with his culture's tales of robots. Therefore, he was predisposed to believe and was convinced that the public would believe with him. Well, won't they? Not really. After the initial shock is over, they will realize that it's a madcap fiction, or they will think so. I've persuaded de Merzel that he must give a talk on Holovision. He is to talk about everything but the robot issue. People will listen and will hear nothing about robots. Then, at the end, he will be asked about the flyer, and he need not answer a word. He need only laugh. Laugh? I've never known de Merzel to laugh. This time, Doors, he'll laugh. It is the one thing that no one ever visualizes a robot doing. So de Merzel need merely laugh. And on top of that, do you remember Sunmaster 14, the religious leader of Mycogen? Of course I do. Literal, minded, unemotional, inhuman. He's never laughed either. And he won't this time. I don't think Sunmaster likes breakaways. But I, I thought you said you don't wish to spark off bigotry. I don't. If I had given the information to the Holovision people, I would have. But I've given it to Sunmaster, where, after all, it belongs. And he'll start off the bigotry. Of course he won't. No one on Tranter would pay any attention to Sunmaster, whatever he might say. Then what's the point? Well, that's what we'll see, Doors. I don't have a psycho-historical analysis of the situation. I don't even know if one is possible. I just hope... That my judgment is right. Ito de Merzel sat there with Harry Selden and Doris Venabili, and at a signal from Harry, he would laugh. Ah, 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 ah. Harry Selden shook his head. That would never sound convincing. De Merzel smiled. <laughs> Selden made a face. Look, I'm stumped. It's no use trying to tell you funny stories. You get the point only intellectually. You will simply have to memorize the sound. Try again, de Merzel. De Merzel tried again. <laughs> All right, then. Memorize that sound. Reproduce it when you're asked the question. You, you've got to look amused. Smile a little. Pull back the corner of your mouth. Slowly, de Merzel's mouth widened into a grin. Not bad. Can you make your eyes twinkle? What do you mean? Twinkle. Doors was indignant. That is a metaphorical expression. No, it's not. There's a hint of tears in the eye, and the reflection of light from that hint of fluid is what does it. Well, do you seriously expect de Merzel to produce tears? And de Merzel was, matter of fact, my eyes do produce tears for general cleaning. Perhaps if I imagine my eyes to be slightly irritated? Try it, said Selden. It can't hurt. And so it was that when de Merzel's talk on Holovision was over, he declared himself ready to answer questions. He did not have to wait long. The very first question was, Mr. First Minister, are you a robot? De Merzel simply stared calmly and let the tension build. Then he smiled and... 
<laughs> His body shook slightly as he laughed. It was infectious. The audience tittered and then laughed along with him. Demersel waited for the laughter to die down. His eyes twinkled. Must I really answer that? Is it necessary to do so? He was still smiling as the screen darkened. Tennis was one of Harry's favorite sports, but he preferred to play rather than watch others. He watched with impatience, therefore, as the Emperor Cleon I, dressed in sports fashion, loped across the court to return the ball, placing it in a non-returnable position and winning the game. He trotted off the court to the careful applause of the functionaries who were watching, and Selden said to him, "'Congratulations, sire. You played a marvelous game.' Cleon was indifferent. "'You think so, Selden? They're all so careful to let me win. I get no pleasure out of it.' "'In that case, sire, you might order your opponents to play harder.' "'It wouldn't help. They'd be careful to lose anyway. "'Being an emperor has its woes, Selden. Geranum would have found that out if he had ever succeeded in becoming one. Cleon disappeared into his private shower facility and emerged, scrubbed and dried and dressed rather more formally. And now, Selden, he said, waving all the others away, the tennis court is as private a place as we can find, and the weather is glorious, so let us not go indoors. I have read the Mycogenian message of this Sun Master Fourteen. Will it do? Entirely, sire. As you have read, Geranum was denounced as a Mycogenian breakaway and is accused of blasphemy in the strongest terms. And does that finish him? It diminishes his importance fatally, sire. There are few who accept the mad story of the First Minister's robot hood now. Furthermore, Geranum is revealed as a liar and worse, one who had the stupidity to be caught at it. Then... Geranum is no longer a danger. We can't be certain of that, sire. History yields examples of men and women who have come back after disasters as great as this one or greater. In that case, let us execute him, Selden. Selden shook his head. That would be inadvisable, sire. You would not want to create a martyr. You can accomplish your purpose in a way that will make you seem enlightened and benevolent. Seem enlightened? Be enlightened, sire. I misspoke. To execute Geranum would be to take revenge, which might be regarded as ignoble. As emperor, however, you have a kindly, even paternal attitude toward the beliefs of all your people. What is it you are saying? I mean, sire, that Geranum has offended the sensibilities of the Mycogenians, and you are horrified at his sacrilege, he having been born one of them. What better can you do but hand Geranum over to the Mycogenians? You will be applauded for your proper imperial concern. And the Mycogenians will execute him then? They may, sire, or they will imprison him for life at hard labor. Cleon smiled. Very good. I get the credit for humanity and tolerance and they do the dirty work. They would, sire. That would, however, still create a martyr. Now you confuse me. What would you have me do? Give Geranum the choice. Say that your regard for the welfare of all the people in your empire urges you to hand him over to the Mycogenians for trial, but that your humanity fears the Mycogenians may be too severe. Therefore, as an alternative... He may choose to be banished to Nishaya, the small and secluded world from which he claimed to have come, to live the rest of his life in obscurity and peace. You'll see to it that he's kept under guard, of course. And that will take care of things. Certainly. Geranum would be committing virtual suicide if he chose to be returned to Mycogen. He will certainly choose Nishaya, and though that is the sensible course of action, it is also the unheroic one. His following is sure to disintegrate. They would follow a martyr with holy zeal, but it would be difficult indeed to follow a coward. 
astonishing. How did you manage all this, Selden? Cleon's admiration was obvious. Well, it seemed reasonable to suppose. Never mind. I don't suppose you'll tell me the truth or that I would understand you if you did. But I'll tell you this much. De Merzel is leaving office. This last crisis has proved to be too much for him, and I agree with him that it is time for him to retire. But I can't do without a first minister, and from this moment onward, you are he. Sire, exclaimed Selden in mingled astonishment and horror. First minister, Harry Selden, the emperor wishes it, said Cleon. Don't be alarmed, said de Merzel. It was my suggestion. I've been here too long, and you are the logical successor. I am not the logical successor, said Selden. What do I know about running an empire? The emperor is foolish enough to believe that I solved this crisis by psychohistory. Of course I didn't. That doesn't matter, Harry. If he believes you have the psychohistorical answer, he will follow you eagerly, and that will make you a good first minister. He may follow me straight into destruction. I feel that your good sense or intuition will keep you on target, with or without psychohistory. But what will I do without you, Daniil? Thank you for calling me that. I am de Merzel no more, only Daniil. As to what you will do without me, suppose you try to put into practice some of Geranum's ideals of equality and social justice. He may not have meant them, but they are not bad ideas in themselves. In addition, you can work all the harder on psychohistory, for the Emperor will be there with you, heart and soul. But what will you do, Daniel? I have other things in the galaxy to which I must attend. There is still the Zeroth Law, and I must labor for the good of humanity, insofar as I can determine what that might be. And, Harry... Yes, Daniel? You still have doors. Selden nodded. Yes, I still have doors. He paused for a moment before grasping Daniel's firm hand with his own. Goodbye, Daniel. Goodbye, Harry. And with that, the robot turned, his heavy first minister's robe rustling as he walked away, head up, back ramrod straight, along the palace hallway. Selden stood there for a few minutes after Daniel had gone. Suddenly he began moving in the direction of the first minister's apartment. Selden had one more thing to tell Daniel, the most important thing of all. Selden hesitated in a softly lit hallway before entering, but the room was empty. The dark robe was draped over a chair. The first minister's chambers echoed Harry's last words to the robot. Goodbye, my friend. Ito de Merzel was gone. Our Daniel Olivar had vanished. Cleon the First, from an entry in the Encyclopedia Galactica. Though often receiving panegyrics for being the last emperor under whom the first galactic empire was reasonably united and reasonably prosperous, the quarter-century reign of Cleon I was one of continuous decline. This cannot be viewed as his direct responsibility, for the decline of the empire was based on overpowering political and economic factors. He was fortunate in his selection of first ministers, Ito de Merzel and then Harry Selden. Cleon and Selden as the objects of the final Geranamite conspiracy with its bizarre climax. Mandel Gruber was a happy man. He seems, though, to Harry Selden, certainly. Selden stopped his morning constitutional to watch him. Gruber, perhaps in his late forties, a few years younger than Selden, was a bit gnarled from his continuing work in the Imperial Palace grounds but he had a cheerful, smoothly shaven face. He whistled softly to himself as he inspected the leaves of the bushes for any signs of insect infestation. He was not the chief gardener, of course. The chief gardener of the Imperial Palace grounds had a palatial office and an army of men and women under him. 
he inspected the palace grounds no more than once or twice a year. Gruber was but one of that army. His title, Selden knew, was Gardener First Class, and it had been well earned, with thirty years of faithful service, service that had extended far beyond that expected of a gardener. For Gruber had attempted to help when an attempt on Selden's life had been made on these very grounds by one of the disgruntled Trantorian factions. It was only the timely intervention of Doors Venaboli that had saved Selden, but Gruber, at least, had tried. Selden called to him. Another marvelous day, Gruber. Gruber looked up, and his eyes twinkled. Ah, yes, First Minister, and it's sorry I am for those who be cooped up indoors. You mean as I am about to be. Oh, there's not much about you, First Minister, for people to sorrow over. But if you're disappearing into those buildings on a day like this, it's a bit of sorrow that we fortunate few can feel for you. I thank you for your sympathy, Gruber. But you know we have forty billion Trantorians under the dome. Are you sorry for all of them? Indeed I am. There be but a few of us on this world that work in the open, but here I be, one of the fortunate few. The weather isn't always this ideal. That is true. Still, as long as you dress fittingly. Look! And Gruber spread his arms open, wide as his smile, as if to embrace the vast expanse of the palace grounds. I have my friends, the trees and the lawns and all the animal life forms to keep me company, and growth to encourage in geometric form even in the winter. Have you ever seen the geometry of the grounds, First Minister? I am looking at it right now, am I not? I mean the plan spread out so you can really appreciate it all. And marvelous it is, too. Please, if you have the chance to take some time from all the heart-stopping work you must be doing, study the design of the grounds. It is a rare beauty, and if I have my way, there should not be a leaf moved out of place, nor a flower, nor a rabbit, anywhere in all these hundreds of square kilometers. Selden smiled. You are a dedicated man, Gruber. I would not be surprised if some day you were chief gardener. May fate protect me from that. The chief gardener breathes no fresh air, sees no natural sights, and forgets all he has learned of nature. For a moment it seemed as though Gruber would expectorate his scorn, but he could not find any place on which he could bear to spit. Selden laughed quietly. Gruber, it's good to talk to you. When I am overcome with the duties of the day, it is pleasant to take a few moments to listen to your philosophy of life. Take care, Gruber. I might have you promoted. Oh, if you but leave me as I am, First Minister, you will have my total gratitude. Selden was smiling as he moved on. But the smile faded as his mind turned once more to his current problems. Ten years as First Minister— and if Gruber knew how heartily sick Selden was of his position, his sympathy would rise to enormous heights. Could Gruber grasp the fact that Selden's progress in the techniques of psychohistory showed the promise of facing him with an unbearable dilemma? Harry Selden could not repress the surge of satisfaction he felt as he entered his laboratory. How things had changed. After ten years as First Minister... He had a whole floor of the latest computers and a whole staff of people working on a large variety of problems. Of necessity, none of his staff, except for Hugo and himself, of course, could really know much more than the immediate problem they were dealing with. Each of them worked with only a small ravine or outcropping on the gigantic mountain range of psychohistory. Even Selden and Amaral could see the range only dimly, its peaks hidden in clouds its slopes veiled by mist. Doors Venaboli insisted that Selden would have to begin initiating his people into the entire mystery. She was right, of course. The technique was getting well beyond what only two men could handle. And Selden was aging. Even Amaral would be thirty-nine within a month, and though that was still young, it was perhaps not overly young for a mathematician. Amaral had seen him enter and was now approaching... Selden watched him, fondly. Amaral was as much a dollite as Rach was, and yet Amaral did not seem dollite at all. 
He lacked the mustache. He lacked the accent. He lacked, it would seem, dollite consciousness of any kind. He belonged completely and entirely to psychohistory. We are making progress, Harry, I suppose, said Amaral. You suppose, Hugo. Merely suppose. I don't want to jump into outer space without a suit. He said this quite seriously. He did not have much of a sense of humor, Selden knew, and they moved into their private office. It was small, but it was also well shielded from sound probes. Amaral sat down and crossed his legs. Your latest scheme for getting around chaos may be working, in part. We can catch glimmers of light and dark. Explain. I can't, but I have the prime radiant. Amaral pressed the security keypad on his desk and a drawer slid open noiselessly. He took out a dark, opaque cube that Selden scrutinized with interest. Selden himself had worked out the prime radiant circuitry, but Amaral had put it together. The room darkened and equations and relationships shimmered in the air. Numbers spread out beneath them, hovering just above the desk's surface, as if suspended by invisible marionette strings. Selden said, Wonderful. Someday, if we live long enough, we'll have the prime radiant produce a river of mathematical symbolism that will chart past and future history. In it, we'll be able to find historical currents and work out ways of changing them. Yes, said Amaral if we can manage to live with the knowledge of the actions we take, which we will mean for the best, may turn out to be the worst. Believe me, Hugo, I never go to bed at night without that particular thought gnawing at me. Still, we haven't come to it yet. All we have is this, which, as you say, is no more than seeing light and dark fuzzily through frosted glass. True enough. What is it you think you see, Hugo? Selden watched Emerald closely a little grimly. Amaral was getting just a bit pudgy. He spent too much time bent over the computers and not enough in physical activity. And, though he saw a woman now and then, he had never married. A mistake. Even a workaholic is forced to take time off to satisfy a mate, to take care of the needs of children. Selden thought of his own still trim figure and of the manner in which doors strove to make him keep it that way. Amaral replied, What do I see? The Empire is in trouble. The Empire is always in trouble. Yes, but it's more specific. There's the possibility that we may have trouble at the center. At Trantor, I presume, or at the periphery. Either there will be a bad situation here, perhaps civil war, or the outlying outer worlds will begin to break away. Surely it doesn't take psychohistory to point out these possibilities. The interesting thing is that there seems to be a mutual exclusivity, one or the other. The likelihood of both together is very small. Here, look, it's your own mathematics. Observe. They bent over the prime radiant display for a long time. Selden pursed his lips, then said slowly, I can tell you which alternative is preferable. Let the periphery go and keep Trantor. Really? What good will it do us to keep the periphery intact if conditions on Trantor force us to stop work on psychohistory? Even if you're right, Harry, what do we do to keep Trantor stable? To begin with, we have to think about it. A silence fell between them, and then Selden said, Thinking doesn't make me happy. What if the Empire is altogether on the wrong track? That thought occurs to me every time I talk to Gruber, the one who came running up with the rake to rescue you at the time of the assassination attempt. Yes, I've always been very grateful to him for that. Gruber likes the open. He wants the wind and the rain and the biting cold. I miss it myself sometimes. I don't. I wouldn't care if I never go out there. You were brought up under the dome. But suppose the Empire consisted of simple, unindustrialized worlds, living by herding and farming with thin populations and empty spaces. Wouldn't we all be better off? Sounds horrible to me. The empire as it is cannot exist for much longer because it is, it is overheated. 
If through psychohistory we manage to prevent the fall, is that merely to ensure another period of overheating? Perhaps psychohistory will show us a path to an entirely new society, one altogether different from anything we have seen, one that would be stable and desirable. I hope so. I hope so, but there's no sign of it yet. For the near future, we will just have to labor to let the periphery go. And that will mark the beginning of the fall of the Galactic Empire. And so I said, that will mark the beginning of the fall of the Galactic Empire. And so it will, Doris. Doris, tight lip, listened to Selden as she sat with him in their home, now the first minister's suite in the Imperial Palace. She accepted Selden's first ministership as she accepted everything, calmly. Her only mission was to protect him and his psychohistory, but that task, she well knew, was made harder by his position, the luxury in which they now live, the careful shielding from spy beams as well as from physical interference, her access to unlimited funds for her historical research did not satisfy her. She would gladly have exchanged it all for their old quarters at Streeling University, or, better yet, for a nameless apartment in a nameless sector where no one knew them. That's all very well, Harry dear, but it's not enough. What's not enough? The information you're giving me. You say we might lose the periphery. How? Why? Selden smiled briefly. How nice it would be to know, Doris, but psychohistory is not at the stage where it could tell us. In your opinion, then, is it the ambition of local, faraway governors to declare themselves independent? That's a factor, certainly. It's happened in past history. Can you tell which governor it might be? Not in the least. All we can force out of psychohistory at this stage is the definite knowledge that if one of unusual ability and ambition arises, he would find conditions more suitable for his purposes than he would have in the past. But if you don't know a little more precisely what will happen in the periphery, how can you so guide actions as to make sure the periphery goes rather than Trantor? By keeping a close eye on both, and trying to stabilize Trantor, and not trying to stabilize the periphery. And just... What kind of instabilities threaten Trantor if we hang on to the periphery? The same possibilities. Economic and social factors, natural disasters, ambitious rivalries among high officials. Trantor seems to be breaking down. The infrastructure, water supply, heating, waste disposal, fuel lines, everything seems to be having unusual problems. And that's something I've been turning my attention to more and more lately. What about the death of the Emperor? Selden spread out his hands. That happens inevitably, but Cleon is in good health. Let's say his assassination, then. Selden looked up nervously. Don't say that. Even if we're shielded, don't use the word. Harry, don't be foolish. It is an eventuality that must be reckoned with. There was a time when the Geranomites might have taken power, and if they had, the Emperor, one way or another, probably not, he would have been more useful as a figurehead. And in any case, forget it. Geranum died last year on Nishaya, a rather pathetic figure. He had followers. Of course, and it would not be at all surprising if there weren't still some remnants left. Isn't it possible that a remnant may be dangerous? I doubt it. It was Jojo's charisma that made the movement dangerous, and he's dead. And he didn't even die a heroic death. He just withered away and died in exile, a broken man. Doors stood up and walked the length of the room quickly. She returned and stood before the seated Selden. Harry, let me speak my mind. If psychohistory points to the possibility of serious disturbances on Trantor, then if there are Geranomites still left, they may still be plotting the Emperor's death. Selden laughed nervously. You jump at shadows, Doris. Relax. But he found that he could not dismiss what she had said quite that easily. The Y Sector had a tradition of opposition to the dynasty of Cleon I that had been ruling the empire for over two centuries. The brief period when Rochelle, as the self-appointed mayor of Y, had challenged the empire 
had added both to Wise's pride and to its frustration. All this made it reasonable that the small band of leading conspirators should feel as safe in Y as they would feel anywhere in Trontor. Five of them sat around a table in a room in a run-down portion of the sector. The room was poorly furnished but well shielded. The leader of the group, his eyes burning with an inextinguishable anger, was staring at the man seated exactly opposite him, a man distinctly older and softer. Well, it is quite apparent that you have done nothing. Explain that," said the leader, who was Gamble Dean Namarty. The older man, his plump cheeks quivering, replied, "I am an old Geranomite, Namarty. Why do I have to explain my actions? Being an old Geranomite may mean no more than that one is an old fool." The older man sat back in his chair. "Are you calling me an old fool?" Me, Kaspel Kaspelov, I was with Jojo when you had not yet joined the party. When you are ragged, nothing in search of a cause. My association with Jojo, forget that. He's dead. I should think his spirit lives on. If that thought will help us in our fight, then his spirit lives on. But to others, not to us. We know he made mistakes. Now let's start fresh, shall we? Whatever use we make of Geranum's memory for outsiders, let us, not ourselves, be transfixed by it. Kasparov sat silent. The other three were content to let Namarty carry the weight of the discussion. With Geranum's exile to Nishaya, the Geranumite movement fell apart and seemed to vanish. It would indeed have vanished, but for me, bit by bit, I rebuilt it. Into a network that extends over all of Trantor, you know this, I take it. I know it, Chief," mumbled Kasparov. The use of the title made it plain that Kasparov was seeking reconciliation. Namarty smiled tightly. "You're part of this network, and you have your duties." Kasparov stirred. He was clearly debating with himself. Finally, he said. May I have the privilege of pointing out what I think is a mistake? Of course, you can speak your piece, Kasparov. What is your point? These new tactics of ours, Chief, are a mistake. They create disruption and do damage. Of course, they're designed to do that. Namarty stirred in his seat, controlling his anger with an effort. Geranum tried persuasion. It didn't work. We will bring Trantor down by action. A power stoppage here, a water break there, a sewage backup, an air conditioning halt, inconvenience and discomfort. That's all it means. Kasparov shook his head. These things are cumulative. Of course, Kasparov, and we want public dismay and resentment to be cumulative too. Listen, the empire is decaying. We're just helping it along a little. It's dangerous, Chief. Trantor's infrastructure is incredibly complicated. A careless push may bring it down in ruins. Pull the wrong string, and Trantor may topple like a house of cards. It hasn't so far. It may in the future. And what if the people find out that we are behind it? They would tear us apart. How would they ever learn enough to blame us? The natural target for the people's resentment will be the government. They will never look beyond that. And how do we live with ourselves, knowing what we have done? Kasparov looked pleadingly across the table at his leader. Namarty clucked his tongue, much as a reproving parrot does when confronting an errant child. Kasparov, you can't seriously be turning sentimental on us, are you? Once we are in power, we will pick up the pieces and rebuild. Kasparov sat there, irresolute. Namarty smiled joylessly. You are not certain. We can't lose. It's been working perfectly. The emperor doesn't know what's going on, and his first minister is a mathematician. He ruined Geranum, true, but since then he has done nothing. He has something called、uh, called. Forget it. This mathematician has nothing. Historical psychoanalysis, or something like that. I heard Joranum once. Forget it. 
Just do your part. You handle the ventilation in the Amoria sector, don't you? Very well, then. Have it misfunction. Either shut it down so that the humidity rises, or a peculiar odor is produced, or something else. None of this will kill anyone. Can we depend on you? But what would only discomfort and annoy the young and healthy may do more than that to infants, the aged, and the sick. Are you going to insist that no one at all must be hurt? Kasparov mumbled something. Namarty said, It's impossible to do anything with a guarantee that no one at all will be hurt. Just do your job. Do it in such a way that you hurt as few as possible, if your conscience insists upon it, but do it. Kasparov nodded his head in resignation. Yes, chief. Well, then, go. Marty sharply gestured his dismissal. Kasparov rose, turned, and left. Marty watched him go, then turned to the man at his right. Kasparov is not to be trusted. Take care of him. The other nodded, and all three left, leaving Marty alone in the room. He switched off the glowing wall panels, leaving only a lonely square in the ceiling to provide light. He thought, Every chain has weak links that must be eliminated. We have had to do this in the past, and the result is that we have an organization that is untouchable. And in the dimness, he smiled, twisting his face into a kind of feral joy. After all, the network extended even into the palace itself, and it would be strengthened. <laughs> The weather was holding up over the undomed area of the Imperial Palace grounds, warm and sunny, and Cleon I was clearly enjoying it. I'm getting old, Selden. Surely it's a sign of age when I don't have the impulse to play tennis or go fishing, but I am willing to walk gently over the pathways. As he spoke, he ate nuts that resembled what on Selden's native world of Helicon would have been called pumpkin seeds. Cleon cracked them gently between his teeth, peeled the thin shells, and popped the kernels into his mouth. The emperor had a number of shells in his hand and looked vaguely around for a receptacle of some sort for his shells. He saw none, but he did notice a gardener standing not far away. Gardener! The gardener approached quickly. Sire, get rid of these for me. He tapped the shells into the gardener's hand. Yes, sire. Selden said, I have a few too, Gruber. Gruber held out his hand, almost shyly. Yes, First Minister. He hurried away, and the Emperor looked after him, curiously. Do you know the fellow, Selden? Yes, indeed, sire. An old friend. The gardener is an old friend? Perhaps you remember the story, sire. It was the time when my life was threatened shortly after I was promoted to my present post. Gruber came rushing up to defend me, and I've considered him a friend ever since. Maggie watches for me, feels proprietary toward me, and I feel kindly toward him. I don't blame you. And while we're on the subject, how is your formidable lady, Dr. Venaboli? I don't see her often. She's a historian, sire, lost in the past. She doesn't frighten you? She'd frighten me. I've been told what she did to that assassin. One could almost be sorry for him. I understand she's known now as the Tiger Woman. She grows savage on my behalf, sire, but has not had occasion to do so lately. It's been very quiet. I think that gardener needs a promotion. Is he good at his job? He's excellent, sire. The chief gardener is getting on and is perhaps not up to the job anymore. Do you think this Gruber might be able to take over? I'm certain he can, sire, but he likes his present job. It keeps him out in the open in all kinds of weather. Peculiar recommendation for a job. But I'm sure he can get used to administration. I do need someone for some sort of renewal of the grounds. Hmm. I must think upon this. Your friend Gruber may be just the man I need. And by the way, Selden, how can you tell me things are quiet when reports seem to reach me every other week of some serious breakdown here and there on Trantor? These things are bound to happen. I don't recall such things happening so frequently in previous years. 
Perhaps that was because they didn't, sire. The infrastructure grows older with time. To make the necessary repairs properly would take time, labor, and enormous expense. This is not a time when a rise in taxes will be looked on favorably. There's never any such time. I gather that the people are experiencing serious dissatisfaction over these breakdowns. It must stop, and you must see to it, Selden. What does psychohistory say? It says what common sense says, that everything is growing older. Well, all this is quite spoiling the pleasant day for me. I leave it in your hands, Selden. Yes, sire. The emperor strode off, and Selden thought that it was all spoiling the pleasant day for him, too. This breakdown at the center was the alternative he didn't want. But how was he to prevent it and switch the crisis to the periphery? Psychohistory didn't say. That evening, Rach came to visit at Harry and Dora's palace suite. When dinner was over, Selden said, You and I, Rach, are going to have a little talk now. Indeed, said Doris. I take it I'm not invited. Ministerial business, Doris. Ministerial nonsense, Harry. You're going to ask the poor boy to do something I wouldn't want him to do. Harry and Rach faced each other in Selden's private office. Have you read much about the recent breakdowns we've been having in planetary services, Rach? Yes, but you know, Dad, we've got an old planet here. The trouble is we can't redo the planet, so we just got to keep patching. I'm afraid so, Rach, but there are some peculiar things about it. I have some thoughts about this. He brought a small sphere out of his pocket. What's that? It's a map of Trontor, carefully programmed. Selden placed the sphere in the middle of the table and placed his hand on a keypad. The light in the room went out while the tabletop glowed. The sphere flattened and expanded, becoming a map of Trontor. <laughs> 